Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another Funky Bunch at Sunday Brunch podcast. How are we all doing today? Oh, I hope you all are ready to jump back into our next topic here inside of the simulation video game subgenre. Now, uh, let's do a quick recap on what a simulation video game is before we jump into our subgenres within there. Uh, so, a simulation video game describes a diverse super category of video games generally designed to closely simulate real world activities. A simulation game attempts to copy various activities from real life in the form of a game for various purposes, such as training, analysis, or prediction. Usually, there are no strictly defined goals in the game, with the player instead allowed to control a character or environment freely. Uh, from three basic types of strategic planning and learning exercises, games, simulations, and case studies, a number of hybrids may be considered, including simulation games that are used as case studies. Um, so yeah, basically a simulation game is the ability for you to simulate life in different ways, giving you various degrees of control, either control of the environment, control of the character, control of both. You know, Roller Coaster Tycoon versus The Sims versus Sim City. It all has varying degrees of everything. So, we went over construction and management simulation, CMS, and now we've got business simulation games. And so, that is where we're going to start off today. Business simulation games, also known as economic simulation games or tycoon games, are games that focus on the management of economic processes, usually in the form of, of, of a business. Pure business simulations have been described as construction and management simulations without a construction element and can thus be called management simulations. Indeed, micromanagements Micromanagement is often emphasized in these kinds of games. They are essentially numeric, but try to hold the player's attention by using creative graphics. The interest in these games lies in accurate simulation of real-world events using algorithms, as well as the close tying of players' actions to expected or plausible consequences and outcomes. An important facet of economic simulations is the emergence of artificial systems, gameplay, and structures. There are many games in this genre, which have been designed around numerous different enterprises and different simulations. Theme Park can be called a business simulation because the goal of the game is to attract customers and make profits, but the game also involves a building aspect <laughs> that makes it a construction and management simulation. The genre also includes many of the tycoon games, such as Roller or Railroad Tycoon and Transport Tycoon. Another similar example of a business simulation that models a startup business is Sim Venture Classic. Trevor Chan is a notable developer of business simulation games, having developed the 1995 game Capitalism, which has been described as the best business simulation game. A sequel was released entitled Capitalism 2 in 2001. An expanded version of Capitalism 2, called Capitalism Lab, was released in 2012 and continues to be updated regularly with new features and improvements. Active development of internet technologies and the growth of the internet audience in recent years gave a powerful impetus to the development of the industry of online games, and in particular, online business simulations. There are more varieties of online business simulations, browser-based and downloadable, single-player and multiplayer, real-time and turn-based. Some online simulations are in primarily at the leisure market, while others have real-world applications in training, education, and modeling. So, because business simulations simulate real-world systems, they are often used in management, marketing, 
economics and hospitality education or hospi yeah hospitality education some benefits of business simulations are that they permit students to experience and test themselves in situations before encountering them in real life they permit students to experiment and test hypotheses and that subjects them more and that subjects seem more real to them when taught passively than when taught passively from the blackboard. Let's try that again. <laughs> Let's start that entire sentence over again. Some benefits of business simulations are that they permit students to experience and test themselves in situations before encountering them in real life. They permit students to experiment and test hypotheses and that subjects, oh my God, and the subjects that are simulated seem more real to them than if they had been taught simply passively from the blackboard. That was a horribly written sentence, but I'm going to go over that anyway. So this is exactly what I was saying last week uh, with the whole, you know, get these games, get these experiences, get all this stuff that you can normally do, like right here, right now, like usually people would be testing out like, or like instead of teaching maths just from a class board, get the students some math games, you know, that not only do they have to get the math done in order to like, you know, beat the game, but it's more involved, you know, it's like, oh, I need to mix a potion so I can heal. To do that, I need two dashes of this herb. I need 20 milliliters of this water. I need to slow stir it over a fire until boiling. And then once it starts boiling, I need to add in, you know... a dash of this and then you know you've got people measuring out 20 milliliters maybe you don't have a milliliter measuring maybe you have to use conversions um you know just all of that it's there are different things that could be used and applying that in a video game is gonna make a student retain math better you know, things I've learned in video games have stuck with me a lot longer because that's the way I did it. Uh, the Simpsons did something like that where Lisa, her teacher, quit school and everybody needed to pass mm, their school tests or else, you know, the school was going to lose funding or something. And Lisa devised a way to teach everybody. She realized that probably the uh, worst doing student in the class was, you know, horrible at retaining information. And he was, quote, dumb. So, but she realized that he could, quote, literally get anything. This is Ralph Wiggum we're talking about, by the way. Um, he could, quote, anything from television. Like, verbatim. And that's when she realized she could get historical people to teach a class on a TV. Because for whatever reason, it coming from the TV would retain better in all the students' minds than if it was live on a blackboard. Because it was a television show at that point. So Lisa, in her efforts to help everybody in the class pass... Turn towards making everything television. And that worked. It was never visited again in the series. But, you know, that that's just, that's the example I want to use. Because there are students who will learn significantly better with simulations. With getting it on a video game. Getting it on even just a simple, you know... 
see it in action. You know, a video, a video game, a simulation game. Just a lot of these things would be a lot better for people. But all it takes is somebody willing to say, hey, let's break from the norm and try something different. And that's the problem. Nobody wants to break away from that norm. So until we get somebody willing to do that, we're stuck with the same old, same old, same old. So, yeah, that's really all I wanted to say on that. So, continuing back to real-world applications. <laughs> they are also used extensively in the professional world to train workers in the financial industries, hospita hospitality and management, and study economic models. The Association of Professionals, ABSEL, exists for the sole purpose of promoting their use. With some sim simulations having in excess of 10,000 variables. Economic simulations have been used in experiments, such as those done by Donald Broadbent, on learning and cognition that revealed how people often have an aptitude for mastering systems without necessarily comprehending the underlying principles. Other games are used to study the behavior of consumers. And we have a very, very short history section. The Sumerian Game 1964, a text-based early mainframe game designed by Mabel Addis, Based on the ancient Sumerian city-state of Lagash was the first economic simulation game. An early economic sim by Danielle Buntenberry, M-U-L-E, Mule, released in 1983, foreshadowed events that would transpire later in video game history, especially in the massively multiplayer online game market with regard to player cooperation and simulated economies. The game was Electronic Arts' most highly awarded game, despite selling only 30,000 copies. The same year... Epics released the business sub Oil Barons. All right, well, that was that. <clears throat> Not much on management simulations, unfortunately. But we've got the life simulation subgenre up next. Life simulation games form a subgenre of simulation video games in which the player lives or controls one or more virtual characters, human or otherwise. Such a game can revolve around individuals and relationships, or it could be a simulation of an ecosystem. Other terms include artificial life game and simulated life game. Life simulation games are about maintaining and growing a virtual life where players are given the power to control the lives of autonomous people or creatures. Artificial life games are related to computer science research in artificial life, but because they're intended for entertainment rather than research, commercial A-life games implement only a subset of what A-life research investigates. This broad genre includes god games, which focus on managing tribal worshippers, as well as artificial pets that focus on one or several animals. It also includes genetic artificial life games where players manage populations of creatures over several generations. <clears throat> so, the history. Artificial life games and life simulations find their origins in artificial life research, including Conway's Game of Life from 1970. But one of the first commercially viable artificial life games was Little Computer People in 1985 a Commodore 64 game that allowed players to type requests to characters living in a virtual house. The game is cited as a little-known forerunner of virtual life simulator games to follow. One of the earliest data sins, Tenshitachi no Gogo, was released for the 16-bit NEC PC9801 computer that same year, though dating sim elements can be found in Sega's earlier Girl's Garden in 1984. In 1986, the early biological simulation game Bird Week was released. In the mid-1990s, as artificial intelligence programming improved, true AI virtual pets, such as Pets and Tamagotchi, began to appear. Around the same time, Creatures became the first full-blown commercial entertainment application of artificial life and genetic algorithms. 
By 2000, The Sims refined the formula seen in Little Computer People and became the most successful artificial life game created to date. In 2007, the game Spore was released, in which players develop an alien species from the micro microbial tide pool into an interstellar empire. So let's look at the different types of life games because we're going to go into uh, two of these. Uh, all right. Digital pets. Digital pets, digital pets are a subgenre of artificial life game where players train, maintain, and watch a simulated animal. The pets can be simulations of real animals or fantasy pets. Unlike genetic artificial life games that focus on larger populations of organisms, digital pet games usually allow players to interact with one or a few pets at once. In contrast to artificial life games, digital pets do not usually reproduce or die although there are exceptions where pets will run away if ignored or mistreated. Digital pets are usually designed to be cute and act out a range of emotions and behaviors that tell the player how to influence the pet. The quality of rich intelligence distinguishes artificial pets from other kinds of A-life, in which individuals have simple rules, but the population as a whole develops emergent properties. Players are able to tease, groom, and teach the pet, and so they must be able to learn behaviors from the player. However, these behaviors are typically programmed and are not truly emergent. Game designers try to sustain the player's attention by mixing common behaviors with more rare ones, so the player is motivated to keep playing until they see them. Otherwise, these games often lack a victory condition or challenge, and can be classified as software toys. Games such as Nintendogs have been implemented for the Nintendo DS, although they are also simple electronic games that have been implemented implemented on a keychain such as Tamagotchi. There are also numerous online pet raising virtual pet games such as Neopets. Uh, other pet simulation games include online show dog raising games and show horse raising games. Uh, biological simulations. Some artificial life games allow players to manage a population of creatures over several generations and try to achieve goals for the population as a whole. These games have been called genetic artificial life games or biological simulations. Players are able to crossbreed creatures, which have a set of genes or descriptors that define the, char the creature's characteristics. Some games also introduce mutations due to random or environmental factors, which can benefit the population as creatures reproduce. These creatures typically have a short lifespan, such as the creature series where organisms can survive for half an hour to well over seven hours. Players are able to watch forces of natural selection shape their population, but can also interact with the population by breeding certain individuals together, by modifying the environment, or by introducing new creatures from their design. Another group of biological simulation games seek to simulate the life of an individual animal, whose role the player assumes, rather than simulating the entire ecosystem controlled by the player. These include Wolf and its sequel, Lion, the similar Wolf Quest, and the more modest Odell educational system series. In addition, a large number of games have loose biological or evolutionary themes, but do not attempt to reflect closely the reality of either biological or evolution. These include, within the God game variety, Evolution, the game of intelligent life, and Spore, and within the arcade RPG variety, a multitude of entertainment software products include Bird Week, Eco, and Evo Search for Eden. And then there's the social simulation. Social simulation games explore social interactions between multiple artificial lives. In some cases, the player may simply be an observer with no direct control, but can influence the environment of the artificial lives, such as by creating and furnishing a house and creating situations for those characters to interact. These games are part of a subcategory of artificial life game sometimes called a virtual dollhouse. The Sims is the most notable example of this type of game, itself which was influenced by the 1985 game Little Computer People. In other games, the player takes a more active role as one character living alongside other artificial ones, engaging in similar life pursuits as to, 
as to, such as to make money or sustain their character while engaging in social interactions with other characters, typically seeking to gain beneficial relations with the all such characters. Some ga- Such games include The Story of Seasons and the Animal Crossing series. Dating sims are related to this type of game, but generally where the play character is seeking a romantic relationship with one or more computer-controlled characters, with such titles often aimed at more mature audiences compared to the typical social simulation game. Dating sims may be more driven by visual novel gameplay elements than typical simulation gameplay. All right, so let's look at some examples. So some examples of biological simulations. There's Bird Week, 1986, a simple game for the Famicom where the player assumes the role of a bird feeding its young. There's Creatura, which is a virtual evolution vivarium with focus on scientifically accurate genetics and enclosed ecosystem simulation. There's the Creatures series by Creature Labs Gameware Development. There's Lion, which is the sequel of Wolf, which simulates the life of a lion, whereas Wolf simulates the life of a wolf, obviously. Uh, There's Odell Lake and Odell Down Under. These are simple educational games about aquatic life and the food chains. Uh, There's Saurian. Simulates the life of non-avian dinosaurs in the Hell Creek Formation. There's Science Horizon Survival, an early game which also teaches about food chains. There's Shelter. Simulates the life of a badger family. There's Shelter 2. Simulates the life of a lynx family. There's Sim Ant, a Maxis game that allows the player to assume control of an ant colony. A uh, Sim Earth, another Maxis game that deals with terraforming and guiding a planet through its geological and biological development. There is Sim Life. Uh, which is another Maxis game, which experiments with genetics and ecosystems. There's Sim Park, which I don't have any information on. There is Sea Man, a virtual pet game that simulates the raising of a talking fish that develops into a frog-like creature. There's Star Wars, the Gungan Frontier, simulates a planet which the player populates with creatures that compete for limited supplies of food. And then there is Wolf Quest. Not much about that that I know of. Uh, And then there are loosely biology and evolution-inspired games. Some games take biology and evolution as a theme rather than attempting to simulate. So there's Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey, came out in 2019, a survival game in which the player guides a clan of primates in their open but hostile environment while overseeing their evolutionary course. Creatures, 1998 to 2002, an early artificial life program. The Creatures franchise features creatures called Norns, each of which has its own digital DNA that later generations can inherit. The Norns are semi-autonomous, but must be trained to interact with their environment to avoid starvation. Then there's Cubivore, Survival of the Fittest, Nintendo, an action-adventure. There's Eco, 1988... Then there's Evo, Search for Eden, 1992, an arcade game which portrays an evolving organism across different stages. Evolutionary points are earned by eating other creatures and are used to evolve. There's Flow, a flash game similar to Evo. There's LOL, Lack of Love, 2000, ASCII Entertainment, a role-playing game. The player assumes the role of a creature, which gradually changes its body and improves its abilities, but this is done by means of more varied achievements, often including social interactions with other creatures. Seaman, Seventh Cross Evolution, and Spore, a multi-genre god game. The first and second stages are biology-themed, although the second stage also has more of a role-playing game element. Uh, And then there are social simulations. I'm just going to run through the name of these. There's Alter Ego, Animal Crossing, Castaway Paradise, Eki, Facade, The Story of Seasons series, The Idol Master, Jones in the Fast Lane, Kudos series, Little Computer People, My Life, My Love, 
Boku no Yome, Watashi no Negai, um, The Princess Maker series, Real Lives, Roots of Pacha, Tenshitachi no Gogo, The Sims, Tomodachi Life, True Love, The Virtual Villager series, Moon RPG Remix Adventure, New York Knights Success in the City, Second Life, Shinmu, Yakuza, Wall Street Kids, and an upcoming indie life simulation game for the PC, Paralives. So that is a big overview of the life simulations. Sorry about that. I had to get my door. Uh, now we're going to go, uh, well, into the uh, biological... That was a quick overview into the life simulation. Now we're delving into that with two closer looks at the digital pet simulations as well as the social simulations. So, digital pet. A digital pet, also known as a virtual pet, artificial pet, or pet raising simulation, is a type of artificial human companion. Uh, they are usually kept from companionship. They are usually kept for companionship or enjoyment. People may keep a digital pet in lieu of a real pet. A cyber pet and Tamagotchi were some of the first digital pets. Digital pets have no concrete physical form other than the hardware they run on. Interaction with virtual pets may or may not be goal-oriented. <laughs> if it is, then the user must keep it alive as long as possible and often help it grow into higher forms. Keeping the pet alive and growing often requires feeding, grooming, and playing with the pet. Digital pets can be simulations of real animals, as in the pets z with a Z series, or fantasy ones, like Tamagotchi or the Digimon series. Unlike biological simulations, the pet does not usually reproduce. So, the different types. There are web-based and software-based. So, for web-based, virtual pet sites are usually free to play for all who sign up. They can be accessed through web browsers and often include a virtual community, such as Neopia and Neopets. In these worlds, a user can play games to earn virtual money, which is usually spent on items and food for pets. One large branch of virtual pet games are sim horse games. Some sites adopt out pets to put on a web page and use for role playing and chat rooms. They often require the adoptee to have a page ready for their Uh, sometimes they have a setup for breeding one's pet and then adopting them out. Uh, some sites use quests in order for users to make points and receive items. Some quests can give stat points to the user's pets for when they are battling. These sites and their clones have a single, non-dynamic image for each pet and its various colors, leading to a lot of similarity in the pets. There are also simulation sites where the web page attempts to simulate a real life discipline such as horse dressage or pedigree dog showing. Often these sites will also have a breeding aspect including genetics and markings. Other simulation sites focus mostly on the markings. And then moving on to the software based, uh, there are many video games that focus on the care, raising, breeding, or ex exhibition of simulated animals. Such games are described as a subclass of life simulation game. Since the computing power is more powerful than with web page or gadget based digital pets, these are usually able to achieve a higher level of visual effects and interactivity. Pet raising simulations often lack a victory condition or challenge and can be classified as software toys. A pet may be, able, may be capable of learning to do a variety of tasks. The quality of rich intelligence distinguishes artificial pets from other kinds of A life, in which individuals have simple rules, but the population as a whole develops emergent properties. For artificial pets, their behaviors are typical, typically pre-programmed and are not truly emergent. A screen, mate is a screen mate is a downloadable virtual pet that creates a small animation that rocks around a computer desktop and over open windows unpredictably. Each Pet is a small animation of an animal, such as a sheep or a frog, or in some cases a human or a bottle cap, that can be interacted with by clicking on or dragging, which lifts the pets from where you were, pick, uh, as if you were picking it up, 
Most screen mates are free to download and use for entertainment purposes. Screen mate, I've never heard of that. Let's take a look. Screen mate. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? Screen mate. Let's see, there's an app on Google Play. Um, looks like there's a lot of different places. Desktop pets. Screen Mate Builder. Interesting. Let's see. Let's see, there's an e sheep, which is, you know, a sheep. Uh, what? Electronic love potato? <laughs> uh, run once, which is a little bunny. There's a desktop goose. There's a gerb. I don't know. Yeah, here, I'll send you this article. Interesting, 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 interesting. I'll have to look at this myself later. Anyway, back to what we were doing. The history. PF Magic released the first widely popular virtual pets in 1995 with dogs, followed by cats, in the spring of 1996, eventually becoming a franchise known as Pets. The digital pets were further popularized when Tamagotchi and Digimon were introduced in 1996 and 1997. Digital pets were a massive fad in Japan and to a lesser extent in the United States and UK during the late 1990s. Today, there are also digital pets, which have physical robotic bodies known as ludobots or entertainment robots. Controversy. The popularity of virtual pets in the US and the constant need for attentions that the pets require led to them being banned from schools across the country, a move that hastened the virtual pets decline from popularity. A mad cover on regular issue number 362, October of 1997, shows a gun being pointed at a virtual pet by Alfred E. Newman's face in the line, if you don't buy this magazine, we'll, we'll kill this virtual pet. Cover parodies the January 1973 issue of National Lampoon, which depicted a gun being held to a real dog's head in the line, if you don't buy this magazine, we'll kill this dog. Lol. Uh, digital pets over real pets. Some people suggest that digital pets are preferable for a number of reasons. Having a digital pet in place of a real pet ensures that real pets do not have to suffer and is arguably training before adopting a real pet. PETA has suggested that robotic animals can help people recognize that they are not up to the commitment of caring for a real animal. Now, I don't like PETA. But I agree with him on that comment. If you can't take care of a virtual animal, you can't take care of a real animal. And that's something that people need to realize. Taking care of animals is hard work. So if you can't take care of a virtual one, if you can't take care of a robotic one, if you have trouble babysitting someone's animal for a couple of days, if you have trouble simply helping somebody else take care of a pet that's not even yours, all those are kind of pointing to the fact that you probably shouldn't have a pet of your own. Another argument is that the digital pet can successfully substitute a real one for children who cannot care for a real pet, such as those who suffer from allergies, and a relationship with the digital pet. 
There is research concerning the relationship between digital pets and their owners and their impact on the emotions for people. For example, Furby affects the way people think about their identity. And many children think that Furby is alive in a Furby kind of way. I told you, Furbies are possessed. Those things aren't animals. Those things are coming to get you. Anyway, common features of digital pets. Uh, there are many common features between different digital pets. Some of them are used to give a sense of reality to the user, such as the pet responding to, quote, touch. And some for enhancing playability, such as training. Of course, there's also that Furby horror game that you can play on Steam. I don't remember what it's called. Um... I gotta look this up. <coughs> Furby horror game. Tattletale. That's what it's called. <coughs> uh, and some for enhancing playability, such as training. Communication. With advanced video game technology, most modern digital pets do not show a message box nor icon display the pet's internal variable, health state, or emotion like earlier generations such as Tamagotchi. Instead, users can only understand the pet by interpreting their actions, body language, facial expressions, etc. This helps to make a pet's behavior seem natural rather than calculated and fosters a feeling of relationship between user and digital pet. Sense of reality. To give a sense of reality to users, most digital pets have certain level of autonomy and unpredictability. The user can interact with the pet and this process of personalizing can make the pet more distinctive. Personalizing increases the feeling of responsibility for the pet to the user. For example, if a Tamagotchi is unattended for long enough, it will die. <coughs> Interactivity. To increase user's personal attachment to the pet, the pet interacts with the user. Interactivity can be classified into two categories, short-term and long-term. Short-term interactivity includes direct interaction or action to reaction from the pet. For example, touch a pet with a mouse cursor and the pet will give a direct response to the touching. Long-term interactivity includes action that affects the pet's growth, behavior, or lifespan. For example, training a pet may have a good effect on the pet's behavior. Long-term interactivity is quite important as a sense of reality as the player would think. <sighs> that he has some lasting influence on the pet. Two kinds of interactivity are often combined. Training, long-term interaction, may happen through continuous short-term interaction. Similarly, playing with a pet, short-term interaction, may, if continued over the long term, make the pet more optimistic. Uh, and here's an example of common features, uh, responding to calling, responding to touching, training of the pet, supplies or toys for the pet, dressing up the pet, competition or trial amongst pets, meeting other pets, complaining when it needs care. All sounds about right. And now moving on to the social simulation subgenre, subgenre, subgenre. Of the sub sub genre. Uh, social simulation games are a sub genre of life simulation game that explores the social interactions between multiple artificial lives. The most famous example from this genre are The Sims and the Animal Crossing series. Uh, the history. Uh, when The Sims re was released in 2000, it was referred to almost the only game of its kind but there are several important precursors to The Sims and the social simulation genre. Firstly, the game's creator acknowledged the influence of Little Computer People, a Commodore 64 game from 1985. The games are similar, although The Sims is described as having a richer gameplay experience. Secondly, Will Wright also acknowledged the influence of Dollhouses on The Sims, which have generally also informed the gameplay of the genre. Animal Crossing was released in 2001 for the Nintendo 64 in Japan. While released towards the end of the life cycle of the Nintendo 64, it developed a following that led it to being ported to the Nintendo GameCube and released throughout the world. As the game's popularity has surged, this series has also been described 
as a social simulation game. Story of Seasons, a series that began in 1996, is often compared to Animal Crossing. Story of Seasons is also called Harvest Moon in the West. Uh, and has also been described as a social simulation game. Its social simulation, el its social simulation elements are derived from dating sims, a subgenre that dates back to the early 1980s with games such as Tenshitachi no Gogo uh, and Girl's Garden. Since the initial success of the games in the early 2000s, video game journalists have begun to refer to a group of similar games as belonging to the social simulation game genre. Uh, in recent history, several other social simulation games have emerged to capitalize on the success of The Sims. Uh, this includes several sequels and expansion packs, as well as games like Singles Flirt Up Your Life, <laughs> with heavy similarities. Alright, so some examples of the uh, life simulation, or the social simulation. So, Little Computer People, 1985. Tenshitachi no Gogo, 1985. Alter Ego, which is a personality computer game, 1986. The Money Game series, uh, which has The Money Game, which is a Famicom life simulation about balancing life with high finance, and Wall Street Kid, the Famicom sequel to The Money Game. Jones in the Fast Lane, 1990, by Sierra. Uh, My Life, My Love, Boku no Yome, Watashi no Negai, 1991, a life simulation of the Japanese Famicom system. Princess Maker series, which is Princess Maker, 1991, by Gainax, a raising simulation which the player must raise an adoptive daughter until she reaches adulthood. The final result varies from the ruling queen to an ordinary housewife to even a prostitute if the player looks after her poorly. Prince Maker 2, 1993. Prince Maker Legend of Another World, 1995. Princess Maker 3, Fairy Tales Come True, 97. Princess Maker 4, 2006. And Princess Maker 5, 2007. Tokimeki Memorial Series, 1994 to 2014. Six main games and a large number of spin offs. True Love, 1995, a Japanese erotic dating sim and general life simulation game where the player must manage the player's daily activities such as studying, exercise, and employment. The Persona series, six main games and several spin-offs. Story of Series, Story of Seasons series, which is a farming simulator, role-playing game, and dating sim rolled into one. Uh, Moon Remix RPG Adventure a social RPG released only in Japan, created by the same designer as Lack of Love and Gift Pia, uh, the Shinmu series, the Sims series, 2000 to 2014, with The Sims 1 in 2000, Sims 2 in 2004, Sims 3 in 2009, and Sims 4 in 2014. I'm assuming this hasn't been updated in a while, but whatever. Animal Crossing series, 2001 to 2020, a life simulator by Nintendo has been dubbed as a communication game by the game as had by the company as had Cubivore, Doshin the Giant, and Gift Pia. Real Lives, 2001, an educational life simulator by Educational Simulations, <laughs> where the player is randomly born somewhere in the world and often must deal with third world difficulties such as disease, malnutrition, and civil war. Then there's the Singles series with Singles Flirt Up Your Life in 2003 and Singles 2 Triple Trouble in 2005. There's Democracy 2005, a government simulation game that was first developed by Posh Positech Games with a sequel released in December 20, 2007 and a third game in 2013. Eki 2005, Facade 2005, an artificial intelligence-based interactive story. Uh, the Knights series with New York Knights, Success in the City, 2005, his social simulation created and designed by Gameloft for mobile phones, Miami Knights, Singles in the City, 2006, and Tokyo City Knights, 2008. Then there's the Idol Master series, an idol raising sim, Kudos, and Kudos 2, the Virtual Villagers, Tomodachi, Castaway Paradise, Stardew Valley, and Goss Electronics with Naver Webtoon. 
So that is basically all the social sims in, you know, a... That's just a quick rundown of that social sim category. But, um... Yeah. Um... So... We don't really have time to jump into the government simulation game, unfortunately. But we're going to 100% blow through. Well, actually, hold on. Let's see. Let me take a look at this. No, that doesn't help me. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, next week, we obviously, we're going to have the government simulation game and the vehicle simulation game. I'm looking to see if there's any others I may have happened to have missed. Not really looking like it. I can re-hit some of these uh, simulation other games, which would be, you know, medical simulation games, uh, photography simulation games, like new Pokemon Snap, uh, there's military simulation games with, uh, which are basically just war games, um, blue collar games, which include realistic and hyper-realistic presentation of blue collar jobs in a game setting. Digital card games, and obviously video games designed to simulate mechanical or other real-world games. Like, there is a simulation game that I would like to get my hands on, but I don't know if people would actually be interested in it. It's Thief Simulator. And the reason I'm just not sure if people would be interested in it is because it is very much um, heavy in the realism, like... Real lock picking. Uh, you know, you have you have to study your targets. You have to learn their uh, their daily routine. You need to you know figure out when they're home, where they will be when they are home. Uh, you need to learn where their cameras are placed and everything. You gotta. Exp uh, Prepare your escape route. Learn where guards are, police are, cameras are. You know, upgrade your equipment. There's lots of different things like that. That I think... I think it would be interesting. But at the same time... Lordy lordy, who really knows... Like, you can learn how to hotwire a car. Is it realistic about hotwiring a car? I don't know. But then you get to deconstruct the car in order to sell the parts in your chop shop. You go to the pawn shop. Uh, you know, if the cops get called, can you hide? Can you escape? You know, that type of thing. I mean, it's currently on sale for seven bucks, but I don't know. There, there, there's lots of things like this that I've been super interested in, so. I don't know. I mean, simulator games are always very interesting to explore, look at, and things. And some, obviously, some things will be more interesting to others. Thief Simulator, super interesting to me. But then let's look up what is considered a very popular uh, simulator that I could never do. Euro Truck Simulator 2. It's got over 319,000 overwhelmingly positive reviews. I actually own this because it was given to me. But, like, all you do is... Drive. Reviews. Unexpe unexpectedly engrossing. 
Heed the mockers and you'll miss the miss one of the PC's finest and freshest driving games. With its stellar gameplay and presentation, Euro Truck Simulator 2 sets a new standard for the simulation genre. These are titles in the simulation market which can be sold on the novelty factor alone, but tend to be disappointing games. Euro Truck Simulator 2 is not one of them. It's strangely cathartic, engaging, and relaxing. Roses are red, violets are blue. The best open world game is Euro Truck Simulator 2. But this thing has over 74 DLCs. Italia, Iberia, Vive la France, Scandinavia, Special Transport, Heavy Transport, Tuning Packs, like Halloween Paint Job. <laughs> Like, a lot, some of these are just, like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Pink Ribbon Charity Pack. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. What was the one? Is it Train? Train Simulator 2021. Well, it's not 2021. It was a different Train Simulator, wasn't it? No, it's Train Simulator. The... Most expensive game, I think, to get the everything in it is Train Simulator 2021. Because they updated the name. Why? It has 628 DLCs. And these DLCs cost... Uh, let's see. What's the cheapest one I can find? 20 bucks? 20 bucks? 20 bucks is the cheapest... Oh, 16 bucks? 16 bucks is the cheapest DLC I'm seeing on this. And the rest are 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks. A pop. For a train simulator. Simply a train simulator. And it has 1,307 achievements. So, like... You may scoff at simulator games, like Euro Truck and other things, but... They are popular. People love them. So, what might not be right for you doesn't mean it's not right for other people. And that's something you should always keep in mind. While it may not be for you, it there could be right for somebody else. And what you think is amazing, like The Sims, I don't necessarily like The Sims. So, that's how it'd be. But, um, yeah, I think we're going to end it here. Because this will give us a nice jumping off point for next week. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for watching and tuning into this podcast. I hope you all enjoyed. And until next week, everybody. Stay Funker PayPal.